This is the sixth and final section on the lecture, Imaging of the Cranial Nerves. Number 11, the spinal accessory nerve. The spinal accessory nerve arises from the medulla and from the spinal cord. There are numerous small rootlets that coalesce together to form the 11th cranial nerve. The roots that arise below the foramen magnum in the spinal cord come up through the foramen magnum, form the nerve, and then go back down again through the jugular foramen. So this is the only cranial nerve that goes in and out of the, uh, of the intracranial vault. So uh, once it, it leaves the jugular foramen, it's responsible for innervating the sternocleidomastoid muscle and the trapezius muscle. Here is a coronal image uh, in steady state free procession showing the small rootlets from the spinal cord extending up uh, through the foramen magnum to form the 11th cranial nerve. The spinal accessory nerve runs obliquely across the posterior triangle of the neck. It has an accompanying lymph node chain, which uh, is mostly uh, zone five of the neck, level five nodes. The spinal accessory nerve usually comes into our discussions when it has been surgically sacrificed. It is part of a radical neck dissection to remove the spinal accessory nerve. When that happens, you get atrophy of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, if it hasn't been resected itself, and the trapezius muscle. Now, there's an interesting secondary finding when you have denervation of the trapezius muscle. Since the trap is responsible for elevating the scapula, there's another muscle that has the same function that becomes hypertrophy to take over that task, and that's the levator scapulae muscle. Hypertrophy of the levator scapulae muscle can be a very confusing uh, phenomenon, both clinically and radiologically. Here's an example of hypertrophy of the levator scapulae muscle. You can see that the trapezius muscle, robust here on the right, is just a thin strip on the left because it has been atrophied by denervation after sacrifice of the spinal accessory nerve. In response, the levator scapulae muscle, usually about this big, becomes markedly enlarged, and you can see the change in the contour of the lateral neck. You can imagine how a clinician seeing this could mistake this for a tumor recurrence arising in the lateral neck. You can see how a radiologist would make a very similar error here, but this is just hypertrophy of the levator scapulae muscle after sacrifice of the 11th cranial nerve. While we're talking about lower cranial nerves, we should talk about the jugular fossa. You've probably noticed that there are three nerves that I mentioned leaving the skull through the jugular fossa, the ninth, the 10th, and the 11th cranial nerves. Um, dysfunction of these nerves can often be caused by masses that arise in the jugular fossa. So let's take a moment to talk about masses that arise in the jugular fossa. There are three main tumors that arise in this location, meningiomas, paragangliomas, and schwannomas. Now, what do these have in common? Well, they have the location, if we're talking about the jugular fossa, they have location in, in common, but they also have enhancement in common. So when you see enhancement of a jugular fossa tumor, you're still left with the same three a differential diagnosis. So how can we tell them apart? It turns out that they have a different effect on the underlying bone. So we're going to need a CT and we're going to look at the underlying bone to distinguish between these. A meningioma causes hyperostosis of the underlying bone. A paraganglioma causes destruction of the underlying bone. And a schwannoma causes smooth, uniform remodeling of the underlying bone. Let's see some examples. Here is the hyperostosis that is characteristic of meningiomas. Meningiomas along the calvarium don't do this quite as often as meningiomas in the skull base do. It's pretty frequent for meningiomas of the skull base, but this spiky look around the outside in the central sclerosis characteristic of meningioma. Look at this permeative pattern of erosion along the lateral and superior margins of the jugular bulb. That's characteristic of a paraganglioma, specific, specifically a glomus jugulary tumor. Once that glomus jugulary tumor has knuckled up into the middle ear, like we see here, we give it the term glomus jugulotympanicum, but it's really a glomus jugulary tumor that found its way all the way to the tympanic cavity.
This permeative, erosive pattern with all of this destruction of the nice cortical surface that should be lining the jugular bulb is what is indicative of a paraganglioma, specifically a glomus jugulari tumor. If you see smooth remodeling around the jugular bulb with a preserved cortical rim pressed inward, that smooth look, that's what a schwannoma of the jugular bulb looks like. Very benign appearance, very smooth remodeling for schwannoma. Our twelfth and final cranial nerve, the hypoglossal nerve. The hypoglossal nerve arises on the anterior aspect of the medulla. It has its own personal canal, the hypoglossal canal. Actually, there's a small artery and some veins that run through there as well, but we like to think of it as the personal canal for the hypoglossal nerve. Um, once it leaves the skull, it dives down, it takes a tortuous course down below the digastric muscle, and then comes back up again into the tongue. This extensive course taking the scenic route through the upper neck exposes the hypoglossal nerve to injury um, particularly from surgeries in the neck and so we often see hypoglossal denervation because of this needlessly complex course of the nerve once the hypoglossal nerve does get into the oral cavity it is responsible for innervating the muscles of the tongue here is what the hypoglossal canal looks like on CT. It is lateral to the clivus and it has nice cortical surfaces on either side. Here's what it looks like on a normal MRI. Here's the hypoglossal nerve coming off the lateral medulla, taking a 45 degree oblique course through the lateral medullary cistern until it runs through its own personal little canal there, the hypoglossal canal. Here's what it looks like on post-contrast imaging, that same uh, 45 degree oblique course, and then running through the hypoglossal canal, surrounded by normal venous blood. There's normal venous pool around it, just that small nerve running down the center of that. When the hypoglossal nerve is injured, the clinical manifestation is when you protrude the tongue, it deviates to the weakened side. Uh, radiologically, what we're looking for is atrophy of the hemi tongue, and usually there's a perfectly straight line right down the center of the tongue. Sometimes the center of the tongue has been displaced to one side or another, but there's a perfectly straight line down the anatomic center of the tongue, and on one side you get normal muscle, and on the other side you get fatty atrophy. Here's what that looks like on a CT straight down straight line down the center of the tongue and on this side the normal muscle infiltrated with some normal fat that's a normal pattern on this side fatty replacement of the normally muscular tongue how does that happen well in this case it's going to be a chondrosarcoma at the skull base right next to the hypoglossal canal here's the normal hypoglossal canal you can see how it's been crushed by this chondrosarcoma of the skull base the hypoglossal canal is the bottleneck for um, uh, for tongue lesions. So when you see this denervation in the tongue, look back to the hypoglossal canal. That's most likely where your lesion is going to be. Here's another example, coronal T1, no, no contrast here. So all of this bright signal, that's fat right so here's the normal muscle of the tongue here is fatty replacement of the tongue on on unenhanced t1 mr this time once again we're going to turn our attention to the hypoglossal canal where we see a schwannoma characteristic enhancement pattern um, but in the location the, the exact location we expect for the hypoglossal nerve running obliquely through the uh, lateral medullary cistern and then right through that hypoglossal canal a hypoglossal schwannoma in this case Here's an example where we see, again, hemi-tongue atrophy, this half of the tongue, fatty replacement, this half normal muscle. So this one has been atrophied. Um, what's going on here? Well, we're going to look right to the hypoglossal canal. That's where these things tend to happen. And we see that there is a large metastasis of the skull base that is secondarily invading into the hypoglossal canal.
There are a couple of less common lesions that can affect the hypoglossal nerve in addition to injury during surgery. You can occasionally get perineural cysts like this perineural cyst right here. You can see how it is displacing and crushing the hypoglossal nerve as it runs through the hypoglossal canal. Uh, these can be fenestrated or, um, or aspirated and the pressure on the uh, nerve can be released. One important differential diagnosis to remember is carotid dissection. Let's look at first at the tongue and you can see, look how bright the, um, the, the tongue is on this unenhanced T1 weighted image. That's fat infiltration of the left hemi tongue. Notice also how the back of the tongue, the tongue base seems to have fallen back as though it has laxity and no muscular innervation holding it forward. It has fallen back. That's also that, that configuration also characteristic of denervation atrophy within the tongue. In this case, we can look to see that on the unaffected side, there is a normal flow void in the internal carotid artery, whereas on the affected side, there is bright T1 signal from the dissection of the internal carotid artery, admittedly a subtle finding, but you know that you need to look there once you see that there is weakness in that hypoglossal nerve. Wow, there is so much to talk about in imaging of the cranial nerves. That was almost two hours of lecture. I love talking about this topic, but that's it. That concludes these lectures on imaging of the cranial nerves.